Today we'll be demonstrating an examination of the hand and wrist. So starting out, we want to just basically observe and inspect the hands. So what we're looking for are any skin changes, any visible deformities, any swelling or edema. We're also going to look at the nails. We're going to turn the hands over and look at the palms in case there's any contracture, such as Deputrin's contracture. Once we've observed, we're going to also check the radial and ulnar pulses. Easiest way to do that, using two fingers, we're going to check the radial pulse. You want to note down whether it's, you know, strong, regular in its rhythm. Make sure you jot these things down as you go through. Then we're going to move to the ulnar pulse. Yeah, nice and steady, very strong. On Lindsay here, I'm just going to check both sides. Once again, the radial pulse and the ulnar. Great. And then what you want to do is also check the temperature on both sides of the hands. So I'm going to use the back of my hands. I'm going to check out the wrists and we're comparing left and right in terms of temperature. I'm going to move down towards the fingers and then we'll have Lindsay turn her hands over and just rest them there. And once again, we're checking the wrists and the fingers. And that would be the first part of a basic hand and wrist examination. Now we'll move on to palpation of the hand and wrist. For the purpose of the video, we'll only be demonstrating on one side. During an actual examination, we would compare the two sides. So starting out, we'll have Lindsay turn her hand over. First off, we're gonna look at the thenar and hypothenar eminences. As we observe, we're looking for any muscle wasting or atrophy. And then we're gonna get in and palpate the bulk of the muscles here. So this is the thenar. Moving our way to the opposite side, the hypothenar. We're going to have Lindsay turn the wrist over. We'll look at the wrist joint or the radiocarpal joint. So we're going to palpate that, creating a bit of passive flexion extension and also a little bit of a shearing force between the carpal bones here. Okay, then here we'd have the carpal metacarpal joint. So we'll also look at the bases of the metacarpals. Moving down, we'll squeeze the carpal metacarpal phalangeal joints here. So squeezing here, but then we're also gonna get in and palpate the individual metacarpal phalangeal joints here. So we're gonna check basically at each knuckle, okay? And then we're gonna move our way down into the proximal interphalangeal and the distal interphalangeal joints. So once again, we're just palpating. You could also create a little bit of rotation, even abduction and adduction, and just move your way through the joints. And we would do that at each finger. Okay, I'm just gonna work my way through. Okay, and then here as well. And lastly, we're not gonna forget about the thumb. So we're looking at the thumb as well. So once again, and here as well, okay. Then turning this over again, we also wanna palpate the fascia of the palm here. And this is where we could quite often see a Deputrin's contracture. There we go, good. Okay, and that is the basic palpation of the hand and wrist. So now let's get more specific with the palpation of the carpal bones. A mnemonic that I learned back in school billions of years ago was, and it may not be appropriate by today's standards, but basically it's some lovers try positions that they can't handle. So that stands for each first letter of that sentence basically designates a particular carpal bone. And we'll go through that now. So we've got the uh, skeleton here, the Earl of Bergamot helping us out as a visual aid. So going into palpation, first we're going to start with the scaphoid, which is this bone right here. So we're gonna palpate the scaphoid. And as we move medially, next we're gonna go on to the lunate, which you would see right here, okay? And then we're gonna move slightly more medial, and we've got the triquetrum. And then right here at the edge of the palm, you can feel the pisiform right here, which stands out. And then moving more distally, starting again at the thumb side, we're gonna palpate the trapezium, which would be here. And then we're moving on to the trapezoid, which would be that guy right in there. And then centrally here, you're gonna have the capitate. 
And then next over is the hamate. You can actually see the hook of the hamate there. So we're going to move here, just distal to the piezoform. Yeah, and you can feel the hook of the hamate right there. And that would be the hamate as well. So that's an easy way to remember the carpal bones. And remember, there's four in the proximal row and four in the distal row. And that is the carpal bones. Now we'll do some brief sensory testing of the hands and wrists. Basically, we're targeting the three peripheral nerves of the upper extremity. So starting out, we're gonna have the patient palms up and we're gonna test both sides at the same time and just let me know if it feels the same, okay? So starting out with the thenar uh, eminences here. How does that feel? Same? Good. Yeah. Good. So that would be the median nerves. Now the hypothenar eminences. How does that feel? Same. Good, and that is the ulnar nerves. And then we're turning the hands over and just at the proximal kind of base of the thumbs here, we're gonna do this. How does that feel? The same. Good, and that would be the radial nerve. So that is a basic brief sensory screening of the hands and wrists. Next, we'll move on to active range of motion of the hands and wrists. So we're looking at the patient, basically have them copy your movements. So Lindsay, I just kind of want you to turn your hands over. Yeah, rest them like that, perfect. So first off, flexion, so bend the wrists down. Ranges should be roughly 70 to 90 degrees. Now we're gonna go into extension. That is also roughly 70 to 90 degrees. Now come back to neutral. I want you to go towards the thumb sides in like that. Now this is radial deviation, which is roughly 20 degrees. We're gonna go the opposite way, which is ulnar deviation, which should be roughly about 30 degrees. Now we're going back to neutral. Turn your palms all the way up. So that's called supination, which should be about 140 degrees. And if we go the opposite way into pronation, that should be roughly 60 degrees, sometimes 60 to 80 degrees. Okay, good. So once we've seen the active range of motion, you can go in and passively uh, create some passive range of motion. So I'm just gonna focus on one hand here so you can rest the other one. So we're basically creating flexion. We're creating extension. We're gonna go into radial deviation, ulnar deviation, and then we're creating some supination as well as pronation. Okay, so that would be a basic active range of motion and passive range of motion examination of the hands and wrists. Now we're moving on to resistant movements. And what we're gonna challenge uh, the hands with these particular tests is motor strength. And once again, we're focusing on the three peripheral nerves. So starting out, I'll have you turn your hands over, okay? And just kind of spread your fingers apart a bit. And this is finger extension. So I'm gonna try to push these down and you resist, okay? So as I push down, you can do it one more time. Yeah, nice and strong, good. So this would be testing the radial nerve. Now, you're gonna spread the fingers apart again. This time I'm gonna to try to push your fingers in together, so resist, okay? So as I try to squeeze these in together, this would be testing the ulnar nerve, okay? And now you're turning your hands over and you're gonna point your thumb straight up, perfect. Okay, so this is thumb abduction. I'm gonna to try to pull it down and that's gonna be testing the median nerve. So resist there, okay, and resist. Perfect, good. So for the purpose of the video, we demonstrated on one side, but once again, when performing this on a patient, you want to compare both sides, so don't forget to do that. One other test I'd like to add to the motor screening is a basic grip strength uh, test. So I'm gonna have Lindsay uh, hold on to my fingers like this and now squeeze with both hands. So this way you can compare both sides. Perfect, and then relax. And this time it's gonna be a pincer uh, test. So using a thumb and index finger. So you can squeeze my fingers there, perfect. Okay, good, and relax. So that's a great way to just basic screening of grip strength. Now we'll get into some orthopedic testing of the hand and wrist. But before we start, I just wanna mention the anatomical snuff box. Now what is that? Lindsay's a perfect uh, candidate for this one because Hers is really visible. So point your thumb straight up. So you can see the two tendons here bordering and there's this little depression. Now this is the anatomical snuff box. The floor of the anatomical snuff box is the scaphoid bone. It's one of the carpal bones. So to palpate this, you'd use your, primarily usually use your thumb and you're gonna put pressure right into that anatomical snuff box. If this were tender or elicited some kind of jump response, based on patient history, if there was perhaps a trauma to the wrist, you could suspect that there could be a scaphoid fracture. So it's a great screening test if you suspect any damage to that scaphoid. Now let's demonstrate Phelan's test. Now this is a test that is specific to carpal tunnel. So 
Basically, we're going to have your patient stand and bring the backs of your hands together. Perfect. And now bring the arms up into that position. Perfect. Okay, so you're going to have the patient hold this position for 60 seconds. And if at 60 seconds the patient experiences numbness or tingling, specifically in the thumb, index finger, middle finger, and the lateral half of the ring finger, that would be considered a positive test for carpal tunnel syndrome. Now let's move on to Tunnell's test. This is basically a test for peripheral neuropathies and it involves percussion. The most common site of doing this would be right here at the carpal tunnel. So you would, using a couple of fingers, tap, and if this elicits a tingling or numb sensation along the course of that median nerve to the fingers, that is considered positive. However, another spot that we often will use Tunnell's test uh, as well is the radial nerve here uh, that could be irritated, especially in Wartenberg syndrome, which is more of a, a sensory syndrome. So if we follow the bulk of the brachioradialis muscle and then the extensor uh, carpi uh, longus tendon, kind of where the junction of the two is, we can tap and sometimes, depending on whether there's a peripheral neuropathy or not, you will get a sensation in this area here to elicit a response. So that would be another form of using Tunnell's test. Now let's demonstrate Finkelstein's test. Now this is a test specifically for de Quervain's tenosynovitis. So to do this, you'll have the patient, um, stick your arm out this way, Lindsay, for a sec. They're gonna take their thumb, you're gonna flex your thumb and then wrap your fingers around it, making a fist, and then you're gonna ulnar deviate perfectly. So as Lindsay's doing this, you can see that this position is stressing the fascia and the tendons uh, along this part of the wrist. And if there's pain that's elicited in here, that would be considered positive for de Quervain's tenosynovitis. Next, we'll demonstrate two tests that are focused on triangular fibrocartilage complex injuries. So the first one is the TFCC test. Basically, you're going to stabilize the patient's wrist. You're gonna hold their hand and we're creating ulnar deviation. And once we hit that end range, we're gonna create a sheer stress on the joint. So we're basically going like this. And that's gonna stress the triangular fibrocartilage complex. If this is painful or you elicit a clicking uh, type of noise, that would be considered a positive test. The second one called Sharpie's test, you're going to stabilize the distal radial ulnar joint with one hand. And then you're going to stabilize the proximal carpals with the other. You're gonna squeeze the radial ulnar joint together, and then you're going to create a rotational, so pronation and supination type force across the joint. And once again, if you hear a clicking or a popping and there's a painful response that's elicited, that would be considered a causative test as well. Now we're gonna examine the first carpal metacarpal joint. And so the test is you're going to stabilize the thumb holding that first metacarpal, and you're gonna create an axial compression. So we're pushing it straight into the carpal bone. And then you're gonna create a grinding motion, either circular or rotational. And you're looking for crepitus, you're gonna feel friction. And if this elicits pain or tenderness, that would be suggestive of injury to that first CMCC joint. So it could be osteoarthritis or some kind of impact injury. And that's how you would assess that first carpal metacarpal joint. Now let's perform the pronator Terry syndrome test. Basically, we're looking for a peripheral neuropathy involving the median nerve, specifically at the pronator teres muscle. So basically, you're gonna have your patient, bend their elbow slightly, you're gonna shake their hand, and what I want you to do, uh, Lindsay, is resist supination. So I'm gonna turn outwards and you're gonna pronate, exactly. Okay, so ready, let's do that. So as the patient is resisting supination, you're gonna passively extend the elbow. And if this recreates any paresthesia, numbness, tingling, or, or pain along the distribution of the median nerve, that would be considered positive for a pronator Terry syndrome. So that concludes our wrist and hand examination. Now in clinic, we would include an upper extremity neurological and vascular examination as part of a hand and wrist examination. If you're interested in seeing some of our other videos, please look at our examination playlist. And once again, thank you for watching. See you next time.